What can we learn from the ancients? Now, originally, my answer to this question was going to be pretty straightforward and simple. I was going to draw various lessons and ideas and values from ancient and classical civilizations and traditions and show how they can be a benefit to us in a time where we have forgotten many of these points and principles, given that we live in the age of modernity. And by that, I do not mean necessarily a chronological designation, but more a ideology, a point of view on the world which is demonstrably false. At the heart of our worldview today is materialism, the idea that the universe is primarily composed of physical matter, and that there is nothing more than that. There is no transcendent order or meet higher meaning. And thus, we use things and we approach things from a perspective of utility and economic gain. By contrast, when we look at the ancient world, there was this sense that the sacred is infused within the material order. When one reads the Iliad or the Bible, it cannot be missed that the gods are behind the natural order. They shape what's taking place. So, for example, the great flood myth of Noah and the Ark, God is the sender of the flood which wipes out humanity. In the Iliad, Apollo is the agent who sends a disease upon Agamemnon's army. Moreover, the gods and the divine direct the course of history. One cannot ignore the role of Zeus and the pantheon of gods in the fall of Troy. It is Yahweh who, through his plagues and his punishment of the Egyptians, enables the Israelites to escape. He achieves the exodus. And it seems that the sacred had a matter of control, a huge amount of control, over the inner life. It is Athena who inspires Odysseus to rally the Greek troops and prevent a rout. It is the Holy Spirit who transforms the mind and heart to conform with the will of God. This sense that the sacred and the material are bound together in nature, in history, and indeed within ourselves, was reflected in ancient cultures in space, time, and hierarchy. In terms of space, or we might say material culture, today we mainly produce things that are functional, that are efficient and good to use, and increasingly they are tremendously ugly. And this is a very negative impact upon those who use such objects and live in ugly surroundings. By contrast, in the ancient world, there was well, there's two things that are relevant here. There was not the same kind of mass production using industrial techniques as we have today. And so every item, every object produced was idiosyncratic. It was shaped by the skill and technique of the craftsman making it. And as a result, there was no identical piece of work. And indeed, each craftsman was able to elaborate, decorate, and beautify the object in ways which weren't necessarily functional, but point towards enjoying the beauty of an object for its own sake. There was a, an idea that sometimes objects and buildings don't need to exist for practical generation of wealth, but for the celebration of their own beauty and for a higher principle or order. And we see this in the elaborate decoration of ancient pottery, depicting great mythological tales and historical episodes, and the existence of mighty temples and gorgeous cathedrals, each with the touch here and there of a craftsman's own imagination. With time, today, we are reduced to being what some have described as homo economicus. We exist to produce, 
and consume. And our time in the week is divided as such. We week work nine till five, Monday to Friday, and then we have the weekend off to rest. Our holidays are our time off from our work. And in those times, we are meant to consume. We're meant to go on fancy holidays, luxury holidays. We're supposed to buy gifts from great corporations and uh, give them to each other at Christmas and so on. And at the end of your working life, you go on to retirement, where again, you spend lots of your money on in, in, engaged in consumption. By contrast, in the ancient and if I may be so bold, push it to the medieval era, there was a liturgical calendar. There was the time of the feasting, and there was the time of the fast. There was the Lent, and there was Carnival. This is most clearly seen in the idea of Christmas Tide, which it came to be typical of Merry England. That although throughout Lent, uh, or Advent even, you would be fasting and you'd be working and it'd be very strict and severe. When you reached Christmas, there would be 12 days where nobody was meant to work and you would have a time of silliness and joviality with your local community. The Lord of Misrule would be appointed. Somebody who did, would not normally be high up on the social hierarchy would be elevated to the ruler and they would preside over partying and games. The nobles would serve their servants the food at feasts, and everybody would have a time together, not to consume products, but to enjoy each other's company, performing common customs. And finally, hierarchy. Today, if there is a hierarchy reflected or um, encouraged by the liberal regime, it's based on merit. However, there's a strong push towards equality or equity, the deconstruction of all hierarchies, of all boundaries for a person to be elevated. As such, there are no inherent distinctions. It is really just based on, if there, if there are any, it's because of your skill or your attributes, but there's no higher meaning to it. It's what makes the system work more efficiently, who's going to be best for the job. By contrast, when we look at ancient societies, there's a sense that there is a sacred order which uh, corresponds to the hierarchy of a society. Your ruler, could be an emperor or a king, may be considered divine in himself. He may be the descendant of the divine. So, like the ancient Saxon kings claiming to be descended from Wotan. Or he may be appointed by God, such as in the medieval Christendom, the divine right of kings. And in each case, there was a sense that the king stood at the axis mundi, the centre of the world. And his being in place, the righteous and just king, held together the moral, social and cosmological order. And when he was displaced or usurped, then entered in chaos. Now, when I was kind of coming up with these ideas and very important points from the ancient times, a problem that I kind of came across was this. Well, it's all very well saying these are important differences between modernity and uh, the ancients. It's all very well pointing out the problems with modernity and how ancient cultures had a much more rich sense of the sacred imbued in their daily lives. But how are we meant to make them a part of our lives? In turn, that leads to the question of what kind of people are we? Because unless we know that, we cannot then seek to infuse our lives with a sense of the sacred. This is where the problem lies, though the kinds of people we are. Oswald Spengler, in The Decline of the West, illustrated the different world feelings between different phases of civilization. By world feeling, he means not just a worldview, how people see the world or the values that they have about the world, and even more than just how they feel about the world at a fundamental level, 
It's almost like a spirit or a geist which directs a culture. And in his view, the classical world feeling or sentiment has two primary components. One is that it, it's very much an external imposition upon human humanity. So the gods are the source of moral order, and they are the instigators of the events within the world. They, you might call them the fates. Humans have very little power over them. Additionally, it's a very static worldview. Zeus, having defeated Kronos, his father, time, is going to be king forever. The gods will exist on Mount Olympus forever. And the great classical city-states like Rome, there's this sense that, well, this is the eternal city. Once it's reached its perfection, once it's reached its fulfillment, that's it. There is no uh, further development or expansion. By contrast, the Faustian world feeling, which characterizes the modern age, is one of the inner will, first and fo foremost, that the individual seeks to have their will extended across all things and in through all things. This is manifested in the Western desire for exploration and conquest, particularly of space. Somebody like Sir Edmund Hillary, seeking to climb Mount Everest for no other reason than it's there, charting the oceans, the great Amazon rainforests, even space travel is an example of this. The contrast between these two worldviews can be most clearly seen in the causes of action. The hero Hercules fights the Hydra because he has been ordered to do so by his cousin, King Eurystheus. It's not of his own will. By contrast, Captain Ahab, out of revenge from an inner propulsion, takes on Moby Dick. Indiana Jones goes to explore in the search of knowledge for its own sake. It's from his own desire. And Captain Kirk, well, he crosses the final frontier. He goes where no man has gone before because he wants to, because he wants to discover and explore and meet new life. We have this opposition then between the external imposition upon humanity of the classical worldview and that which prizes the internal. And this conflict was represented by Richard Wagner in his Ring Cycle, particularly when Wotan, the king of the gods, is in conflict with Siegfried and his spear, which has inscribed upon it the treatises and the laws which uphold his power and authority. It is shattered by this fearless warrior who imposes his will upon the world and establishes a reign of love. This then raises the question, what can we, we as Faustians, learn from the ancients? Especially, especially important when the lessons of the ancients run against those core features, those essential characteristics of how we feel about the world. We want to be the drivers of our morality, of our spirit. Whereas the ancients had this sense that they should obey an external force. I honestly don't know the answer to that question. I have an inclination, an intuition that there is much to learn. And perhaps somebody like Soren Kierkegaard, who's analysis of Abraham and his sacrifice of Isaac set it within these discussions may provide an answer. But in general, I, I find it very difficult to, to address how far we can adapt ancient principles to Faustian world feeling. Setting aside the question for the moment, leaving it up to you to make up your own minds, I think there is one thing that we can learn, for sure. The very fact that we can make, we have this difficulty, the very, 
the very problem that we face, that we are not like the ancients, tells us something. Things come to an end. Not everything lasts forever. The ancients knew this well with their stories of Atlantis, this great civilization being drowned beneath the waves. Of Troy, again, another wonderful city to have been left in rubble and ruin by the, the Greeks. And finally, Rome itself, described as the eternal city, which was thought to last forever, to send its light around the world, its glory and splendour was sacked. It was sacked. The fall of Roman Britain in particular points to these realities. There are debates about the speed and extent of this collapse. And while some areas survived, particularly in the north and west of England, the money economy shrank considerably. Mass industry disappeared. Several towns were abandoned. Scavenging and reusing of older technologies became common, and people had to go back to subsistence farming. The Anglo-Saxons the Anglo-Saxons were well aware of this reality, and when they encountered these ghost towns, they were struck by their former glory. This is expressed in the old English poem The Ruin. Wondrous is this stone wall, wrecked by fate, the city buildings crumble, the works of the giants decay. Roofs have caved in, towers collapsed, barred gates are broken, hoar frost clings to mortar, houses are gaping, tottering and fallen, undermined by age. It's not just that things end, it's that they are precarious, far more precarious than we expect. And it's often not a case of progress. Things end and they get worse. The previous era, as the poem describes, is one that was built by giants. That's how they described the Roman works. In part, this was because it reflected their brilliance and magnificence. After the fall of Roman Britain, the ability to build using stone and mortar largely disappeared. The Saxons didn't do it. And so this points towards a golden age in comparison to what is now. This challenges us on two fronts. Firstly, it challenges the modern West with the myth of progress, that things are always going to continue and get better, that we are on the right side of history and it is inevitable that progress will succeed. No, things end and they get worse. But for us, for us who are sensible centrists, it also challenges us to be more serious. I think many of us are quite unserious. We don't really believe that things can get worse. And we don't really believe that what we care about and love can die, that it will die. We think that somewhere somebody's going to save the day. Or we think, well, things are bad, but it's going to carry on like this. We may not explicitly believe it, but we feel that. However, when we recognise the mortality of peoples and cultures, when we're aware that things can end and that things can always get worse, that forces us to ask a question. What is worth fighting for? What do we want to preserve? What do we want to re-establish? Because these things aren't just going to continue. We have to fight for something if it has any chance of surviving. We may lose. In, in all probability, we will lose. But if we don't fight, there's no chance at all that it will survive. So if we want to be stewards, if we want to pass things on to our children, or our children's children, if we want to give, have any hope that we can preserve anything, we need to remember and learn from the ancients that things can end.